cherished American value. And I'm not going to talk about liberty or democracy, but money. <laughs> talk about making money. And to expand upon what Dr. Magyadis has just discussed in terms of seeking value in higher phenolic olive oil. So I'd like to talk about the marketing potential of oleocanthal and other phenolic compounds in olive oil and what would be in it for the producer to seek to achieve those levels of quality. And I'd like us to consider that the United States would be a good target for this market. And I'll tell you why. First, the U.S. Uh, is the leading, the world's leading consumer of functional foods. Have you heard this term, functional foods? So a functional food is, is roughly defined as a, a food that not only provides basic nutrition, but also has other components that uh, are good for health or could, could prevent disease. And the U.S. eats more of these types of foods than anywhere else. It's a big market for it. And one example would be a dairy product with enhanced probiotics for better digestive health, for example. So that's one reason why the U.S. would be a, a good target, is they, they're receptive to these types of healthy foods. Secondly, the United States is the third largest consumer of olive oil in the world. 95% of it is imported. And so it's a country that is consuming quite a lot of olive oil. It's receptive to olive oil and imported olive oil uh, already. And the third reason is that even though we're consuming a lot of olive oil just behind uh, Italy and Spain worldwide, the per capita consumption is not very high. It's only one liter per person per year. In Greece, it's 18 liters. In Italy, I think 15, Spain 12. One liter is all we're consuming in the United States. So there's a lot of room for growth. So I, in pre preparation for this talk, I looked at some academic literature, but I also spoke with some people in the United States who are experts in this field uh, in consumer marketing of agricultural <coughs> products, particularly healthy products, to get their advice and to learn some lessons that I'd like to share with you. And one of the people I spoke with is a public relations consultant who's worked at the very highest levels in the United States in promoting agricultural products. And his name is John Sagale. And John told me that in today's economy, today's consumer, they are focused on health issues. He said, it's not enough for a producer to market peaches from California. Today's consumer is looking for healthy products and that's expressed in looking at organic or farm to fork or other types of foods that can improve their health and they're willing to pay for it. And these functional foods actually do get a price premium in the market. So what are the steps in making these products more available and getting consumers to buy more of these products. Well, the first, and it's really the topic of this conference, is in conducting research. You need to get the research basis in place in order to make a health claim. And so the talks that you'll be hearing in the conference will be looking at the physiology and response to oleocanthal and looking at bioavailability, and discussing clinical trials. And all these are fundamental in establishing a research basis to hopefully get an official health claim that could be attached to that product. And as Procopius mentioned, there's already a health claim here in the EU, a new health claim related to hydroxytyrosol. There's also an existing health claim in the EU dealing with the the benefits of a high phenolic olive oil, or at least even the phenolic content of olive oil, providing benefits for oxidative stress. In the United States, we don't have yet these types of health claims. And 
the organization in the United States that would make a determination on these health claims is called the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. And what they do, just as they would do here in Europe, is they would look at the health data available, look at all these studies, and then they would make a determination about what an acceptable health claim would be. And so I think in this case that the fact that the Europeans have already adopted a health claim related to phenolic content in olive oil and its health benefits provides a, uh, an entree into the United States taking that same data that was persuasive here in Europe and submitting it to the FDA to see if they would adopt a similar health claim in the United States. So that would be a very good step because once the health claim is there, that provides a tool for the marketing people to then help sell and promote that product. John Sigali said it could be either the primary focus of the marketing campaign or the secondary focus, but it is really helpful to have the, the health claim. So step one, getting the research established, seeing if you can get a health claim, and the question is, is there enough evidence currently for that to be persuasive to the FDA in the United States? So the second step would be to find out about consumers and what you know about consumers in, in each market area. And I spoke with Dr. Christine Brune, who was just wrapping up a 40-year career as a consumer food specialist at UC Davis. And she said, you know, this is really where you need to start when you're, when you're looking to market to consumers. You want to find out what they know, where they get their information, and who they trust. And that's important because that'll help shape how you market to the, those consumers, and it will allow you to spend that marketing budget more effectively. So as it happens, there is some very recent consumer information about Americans that was just released last week by the International Food Information Council. And this is a, a foundation that does research on an annual basis, and they just released their 20, 2016 Food and Health Survey of American Consumers. So let's look at so, some of what they found about American consumers, see how it might apply to the subject of this Congress. So there was the question of how much of an impact do the following have on your decision to buy food and beverages? As you can see, taste is up there, price is up there, but health, healthfulness is also very high in the consumer mind in the United States. 64% said it uh, has an impact on their decisions. And you can see how in this graph here, how those percentages have moved over the last 10 years, but they're, they're roughly staying stable. So health is, is definitely in the top three of the considerations of the American consumer. And then the survey also asked, how do you define a healthy food? And what's interesting is that for a lot of Americans, they define a healthy food by things that it does not contain. Uh, so look at this, that's the top reason that 35% say that if it doesn't contain certain ingredients, say saturated fat or sugar or something like that, that's their definition of a healthy food. But if you look at the other reasons that they cited, you can see that this fits quite well with olive oil. You could almost say that each of these describe olive oil. And so it seems that you've already got a basis with American consumers to sell them more on olive oil. Get them way above that one liter per person. And then what, what, getting back to what Christine was saying about who do consumers trust? Well, this tells us, at least in this survey, who they trust the most. Dietitians, nutritionists, and food, um, your personal health care professional. So it would seem that a marketing campaign uh, trying to appeal to the American consumer would want to include uh, one of those people as part of the effort. 
Christine was telling me you want someone that is independent, that has no financial conflict of interest, that's someone that can be trusted. And these are the people that Americans trust. So, uh, you know, people in America are, are concerned about their diet. Uh, even though we're the top buyers of functional food, we do have a lot of health problems. And so people are motivated to change their eating habits. And so the survey asked them, well, what, um, what motivates you to change your eating habits? And whoops, a little, a little fast. First reason is I want to lose weight. Second reason, I wanted to protect my long-term health. And the third is I want to feel better and have more energy. And so this, again, provides some clues as to a marketing effort on reaching Americans some of the themes that you would want to emphasize, long-term health, oh, I want to feel better, I want more energy, um, I want to lose weight. And I think uh, Mary Flynn, no relation, who you'll hear from tomorrow, has done some work that, uh, with, with her patients dealing with, with weight management, where olive oil does play a role there. Seems counterintuitive, but, but olive oil actually can help in managing weight. So those are some general areas of where the consumer uh, is in the United States and what they're thinking, who they trust, where they get their information. But it would be also helpful to have more specific consumer information as it relates to olive oil. And a few years ago, the UC Davis Olive Center did such a survey. We wanted to find out what consumers knew about olive oil, why they bought it. And what we found was that, and this was a survey of two th more than 2,000 consumers, we found that the top reason that they buy olive oil over other cooking oils, and 82% of, of the survey respondents said this, is for health. 82% said they buy olive oil for health. 80% said they buy it for flavor. So those are the top two reasons why Americans buy olive oil, at least according to the survey three years ago, health and flavor. So that's good to know. We've also done at UC Davis through our sensory science um, experts on the faculty, we wanted to find out what did consumers like about the flavor of olive oil. And this pertains to the flavor profile if you're seeking to get a high oleocanthal content, a high phenolic content, as uh, Procopius mentioned, it affects the flavor profile. So on those early olive, uh, olive oils, those that are harvested early, you tend to have these greener and more bitter and pungent components of the oil, the spiciness, that ibuprofen effect that uh, Dr. Gary Beecham had found. So, so that's uh, something that we need to, to find out. What do consumers like that profile? So there was a sensory study that was done a few years ago at UC Davis. And it compared what consumers liked about olive oil with what, say, an expert panel of tasters would like about olive oil. People that judge uh, olive oil competitions, for example. And what you find is that the people who judge those competitions tend to like the bitter and pungent oils. You start to grow to like those the more you're experienced with them. But for the beginning taster of olive oil, it may not be a profile that they like very much. So here were the results of that study, of a consumer study on the flavor profile of olive oil. 26% liked the robust style, that greener, bitter, and pungent style. Uh, about 30% liked a combination of different styles, the riper style, the greener style. They, they liked olive oil pretty broadly, and they, they were receptive to, to a lot of different styles. 44% of the consumers actually liked the oil more if it had defective flavors, rancidity, fustiness. Most of the, the biggest group here liked the oil better if it had those components. And the only th 
thing that we can say to explain that is that when we've tested olive oil off the shelf, we found that a lot of these oils that say they're extra virgin actually do have these rancid and fusty okay. components. So it's a profile that Americans are used to, and when they taste it, at least for a good uh, large segment of them, it's the familiar flavor of olive oil. So that's something to consider when you're marketing to, to Americans is there's a, a fair number of them that, that like the olive oil that they have been used to, but there's a significant portion of them who are receptive to the greener, um, more bitter, more pungent styles in which are reflecting the higher phenolic content oftentimes. Find out what your consumers think. And then the third part of this is to educate the consumer. And I spoke with Gwen Young, who's the president of the Tomato Foundation, which is a nonprofit seeking to promote the healthfulness and demand for tomato products. And she said, you can't afford to do nothing, otherwise you just remain a cheap commodity. And that's certainly an issue I think a lot of people in the olive oil sector have about the prices that they value. And that's the subject of this competition and, and trying to help the producer get more value and for the consumer to perceive more value in those higher phenolic oils. So let's look at some ways to educate the consumer. And there was another study that was done on a survey of consumers on consumer trust and it found when consumers are looking uh, to where they can get health information, which is one of their top concerns, in this survey and in the surveys I had, had talked about before. Um, where do they get this information about health? Well, for half of them, they get the information off the label of the product. Half. And then there, there's additional information they might get from a third party website, say uh, WebMD, maybe the Mayo Clinic, or food bloggers, for example, or health bloggers. Uh, they get some from the company website, but only about 17% would go to the company website. And then about 8% would get it from a QR code, which typically would be on the label. So 50% look to the label for health information, and if there's a QR co code on there, another 8% would grab it from there. So the label is important, and um, in a minute I'll, I'll show you some labels that I took, looking at some photos of actual products on the shelf in the United States. Another area that you need to think about in this educating the consumers, it's an educating the consumers, another word for marketing, is to keep it simple. And what Christine Brune told me was, the information needs to be understandable and actionable. And a couple of studies also addressed this. One had said, you've got to avoid the specialist terminology and the medical details. And the other said, consumers need to understand the benefits. They don't need to understand the science behind the product. So even though we're going to hear about that science, and it's important to understand why olive oil and, and the phenolic compounds are, are healthy, the consumer doesn't necessarily need to know all the details. They just want to know, is it healthy or not? Why, you know, they want to have a general sense for why it's healthy. And you can imagine, you know, we all go to the supermarket, you look at the shelf, you don't spend a whole lot of time necessarily uh, mulling over the, the information that is in front of you. You tend to make fairly quick decisions. So that's why it's important to keep this information simple. So let's look at a few labels that I took some pictures of just last week in, uh, in Sacramento, California. And here's one, a uh, fairly big bottling company from Spain, Carbonell. It's not a major label that we would see in the United States, however. But you can see that they are clearly marketing toward health right on the front of the label. You got a heart shape illustration. It says heart healthy. It tells you you can turn it around the container and get more information about why olive oil is healthy. So that's a pretty good illustration of keeping it simple, marketing to health. And it's got a much bigger emblem, uh, well, a pretty big emblem at the top talking about heart, how heart healthy it is. And then Mazzola also makes corn oil. And you know what? That's also heart healthy. 
So the price of these products are a lot less than olive oil. So where is the consumer going to perceive that they're getting extra value from olive oil? It's just something to consider, and it's really part of what this oleocanthal society is trying to work through with the industry is how do we get this information in front of the consumer so they perceive more value. So let's look at another label. This is soy oil. Nut nutrioli. Uh, that's, that sounds pretty healthy. And, and they, they even tell you it's healthy in English and Spanish at the top. So soy oil is healthy. And so what we're seeing here is that these other oils that are not oil, olive oil, they've been hearing about that olive oil is healthy. And they're in the marketplace. They're saying, well, we're going to say we're healthy. And we've got some studies on our side that can say we're healthy. And that's what olive oil is competing with in the United States. So here's one more example. Oleico. Oleic, oleic acid is the main acid, fatty acid in olive oil. This is high oleic safflower oil. They, they've bred safflower to have a high oleic content. And look what else is on the label. They've got a nutritionist. And she's very attractive. I think there would be a lot of people that would listen to her advice. She says, this is good for you. So maybe olive oil needs to get some of this, uh, this sex appeal in the product. But it may be that olive oil is not something that wants to identify so strongly with health. And so I talked to uh, some olive oil producers about this. And, uh, and one of the producers, one of the better olive oil producers in California, uh, Lucero, uh, which is headed up by Liz Tagami, she said, as a producer, we don't want to market to health. We want our sound and our look to be delicious and gracious. So she's really thinking, we want, we're presenting an image here, and we don't want to necessarily have people buy our product because it's good for them. We want them to buy it because they like it, and they like our story. And so that's, that's a legitimate point of view. And, and the industry may want to consider what their marketing angle is. There's, there's room for lots of different marketing angles. Um, the, the, the industry might also want to consider some other aspects here about high phenolic oil. I already showed that some consumers don't like that profile. But the producer might not want to give up the yield that you would give up in an earlier harvest uh, just to get a higher phenolic content particularly if, the, if that grower is not getting a higher price. So that's a consideration that, that we, we must keep in mind. And the producer may not want to change their processing parameters to ensure that that oil will be higher quality. In fact, there are things you can do in the processing of olive oil with heat and time um, to increase the phenolic content but that isn't not necessarily going to increase the flavor quality. So you may find yourself with a high phenolic content, but you don't meet the extra virgin standard. And maybe your oil doesn't have a high shelf life either. So these are, I took my phone off, so it's not me that's doing this. Um, so, but, you know, maybe this high phenolic content doesn't necessarily need to come from olive oil. Olive oil is one product. The, Dr. Amerigo had talked about other products that the society is working on, cosmetics and, and so forth. Here's a couple of examples that I'd like to share with you from the United States. One is this capsule that has freeze-dried uh, hydroxytyrosol that comes from the wastewater from olive oil production, which has a much higher content of the phenolics phenolic compounds than the oil itself. So trying to get value out of that wastewater is, a, is a definitely an area for the industry to consider. We've done some research at UC Davis, which shows that you can filter that water and get a high phenolic extract that you could then use for other products. It's, but it's now really up to the market to decide if there a value to that and how could they sell it. 
we know it's, it's possible relatively inexpensively to concentrate the phenolic. So this is a product. Um, here's one that I think is very interesting. There's a product in the United States called Five Hour Energy. And you remember from the survey that energy, feeling better, is one of the main concerns that, that would change a consumer's uh, eating habits. They want to feel better. They want more energy. This product goes straight to that concern. These are little bottles of, I don't know, 20 milliliters. And they sell each of these bottles for about $2.50. And it's something that you can buy right at the cash register, or say at a gas station or a, a convenience store. And the active ingredient in this five-hour energy is caffeine. <laughs> it's, no, it's no magic. It's caffeine, and they add some vitamins. And the vitamins have not been proven to provide any additional energy. And a comedian in, in the United States, Jerry Seinfeld, said, why just five hours of energy? I mean, why, why just stop at five hours? But you can buy fortified, you could probably get 10 hours of energy in some of these products. This product, so the, the total sales of this product in 2012 were over a billion dollars, which is more than the value of all the olive oil sold in the United States. These guys are onto something. So, so even though this might not be the type of product that an olive oil producer would automatically think of uh, in producing, because you, your olive oil producers, you know, you've, you've had a history of producing olive oil, that's the profession. But some of these other pr products might be very profitable. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about money. So now let's talk about some ways in which this marketing, these marketing efforts are carried forth. I took a couple of examples from the United States. And I think it makes sense to really look at those who have had a lot of success. Uh, almonds in California, a huge crop. California produces 85% of the world's almonds. There's something called the Almond Board of California, which is a marketing and research board set up under the state of California overseen by the Department of Agriculture. And there are other commissions like this, or, or boards, that have been set up for other commodities in California. The Almond Board of California is someone we should look to, given the success they've had. One of their most uh, effective marketing efforts that I still remember, and even though they haven't run this campaign in more than 10 years, they, they had the, the campaign, the marketing campaign of a can a week is all we ask. One can a week is all we ask, is that you eat one can of almonds a week. And that drove up demand. One can a week, that's a good idea. In, in, if we applied the same thought to olive oil, we're only consuming one liter per year per person. If we consumed about 25 grams, which is what the um, FDA current health claim just on the monounsaturated content of olive oil, they, they recommend about 25 grams. If we actually consume that every day, we would go from one liter to 10 liters. So maybe the campaign needs to be two tablespoons a day is all we ask. And maybe the poor spout, you know, Every time you get a glug out of the pore spout, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a tablespoon. So something to think about. But the Almond Board of California, this is from their website. And look at this. Power up energy with plant-based recipes and tips from culinary nutritionist Michaela Rubin. So they're paying attention to what consumers want. This was not. They didn't create this campaign based on what I showed in my earlier slides that they saw my slides. They know this. They have the money to do the research. These are what the, one of the most successful commodities in California is doing. And then an, another 
example is the Tomato Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit organization. I showed a picture of Gwen Young earlier saying you've got to do something. You don't want it to remain a cheap commodity. So they do uh, education. They fund research. It's all funded, uh, nonprofit, non-governmental organization, and they're just trying to increase demand. And one of the things that Gwen told me is that, look, we don't have that much money in this foundation. And what we find where we get a lot more uh, value is in collaborating with other products. Uh, so they have a collaboration with the International Olive Council. Tomatoes and olive oil go together. And in fact, the, the, um, one of the valuable components of tomatoes is lycopene. And you actually can get more availability of the lycopene and more benefit from lycopene when the olive oil is, is served with the tomatoes. So that makes a lot of sense to look at collaboration. It's a Mediterranean diet, as Dr. Amerigo has, has talked about. It's not just olive oil in isolation. It's, it's the whole diet. And sometimes you can get more um, value with your marketing dollar by combining with other sources. So just in summary, these were some of the main points. Functional food equals higher price and profit. Research gives you a basis for the health claim and a marketing edge. A survey the consumers, build on what they know, identify market segments. It could be that you're aiming at women, 55 plus, college edu educated, higher income. That's actually a very good set of, of criteria for a market segment that would be receptive to high phenolic olive oil. Educate your consumers, use trusted sources, look at using the labels and websites, look at new media, uh, not just the traditional media, but look at new media, bloggers and others where you can get more bang for the buck. Model um, what we talked about, nonprofit foundation and industry commission and working together in collaboration so you can get more value. So that's, that's really what I wanted to say is uh, if you're looking to get more money and more value from oleocanthal, you need to learn from what the experts are telling us. And ultimately what we're talking about is higher quality, better health, and more money in the producer's pocket. Thank you very much.